It was one of the most tragic operations in law enforcement history. As soon as I got off my bed, a bullet had came straight through the wall. And children were the pawns. I heard my grandpa, he was begging David to kill him because he had been shot. He would snap. The next minute, he was like a viper. The 51-day siege at Waco divided families forever. I really love my dad. I don't think I really realized that um, he would not be coming out with me. Now, rarely seen video and interviews reveal the struggles of the most innocent of victims, the children of Waco. Early morning, February 28, 1993. After months of surveillance, the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms tries to serve a warrant for illegal guns on David Koresh. Koresh heads the Branch Davidians, a fundamentalist religious sect that for decades has lived near Waco, Texas. The ATF have force and numbers, but the Branch Davidians have been stockpiling firearms for years. Within moments, there are shots fired from both sides. There are 75 men around our building and they're shooting at us. And there are children and women in here and to call it off. I never really believed that the apocalypse was coming and the world was going to end. But all of a sudden, the ATF showed up. As the gunfight begins, the children are asleep in their bunks. David Jones, the father of the Jones family, had learned of the raid from reporters on the roads nearby and returned to tip off Koresh. Next thing I know, they're all running up and down the halls, passing out guns, and he's telling women and children to get in their rooms, get on the floor. I remember looking out the window and uh, seeing the trailer truck and they pull in and a bunch of guys start jumping out the back of it and that was when we got on the floor and you hear David and them screaming back and forth, you know, there's women and children in here. You know, don't shoot. Then all of a sudden, you know, next thing you know, it was just gunfire. Guns started going off everywhere. It was, it was like war. <laughs> Shooting the walls above us and the sheetrock was flying and you could see it. All of our stuff getting shot up, blowing off of our dressers, and more holes going through the wall on the other side. It's kind of scary. For decades, children had been raised to carry on the faith of the Branch Davidian community. They lived with their parents at Mount Carmel, a ramshackle complex near Waco, Texas. Mount Carmel operated like a religious commune with shared meals and bedrooms for more than 100 members. Only the kitchen had running water. It was a rough environment, but some of the children still have fond memories of Mount Carmel. Me and my brother used to go fishing all the time, and my dad would go fishing with us. We had um, go-karts and little motorcycles and dirt bikes. We'd ride them all the time. It was pretty much play every day, unless you got in trouble for something. <laughs> Kevin's parents were both raised at Mount Carmel. The Branch Davidians had been at the site for almost 60 years as an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventists. The fundamentalist group celebrated the Sabbath on Saturday and had strict rules about diet and dress. Girls had to wear long tops and have blouses down to here, so when we bent over in the gardens, our bottoms didn't show because we worked with the boys, and they can have the boys looking at our butts. <laughs> in 1981, a long-haired stranger came into the group. Vernon Howell, the man who became David Koresh, did not resemble a messiah. He had long, stringy hair. He looked like a hippie. That's my first memory of him, just coming through the door looking very bohemian. He just Open, opened up the Bible, started reading and talking, and he would go on for hours, and I'd be fascinated the whole time. That had never happened before. I mean, when was the last time you went to a Bible study 
and got all excited. I waited patiently on the Lord. Koresh's mastery of the Bible could lead to all-night study sessions, both inspiring and sometimes intimidating to children. Where's the rock at, class? Most of the time, he never had the Bible in his hand. I mean, he just talked from memory, I guess. Sometimes he was, he was really moving. You could, you could get into what he was saying and just, just listen for hours. But he was very strict, very strict. I mean, from like, you know, when we had Bible studies and everything, you know, you say you have to use the bathroom, he'd tell you, well, you should have went before you came in here, so go on yourself. He was pretty strict. That's just how he was. He ran everything. Koresh's dominance of the group grew over time. The children became familiar with the helper, a small wooden paddle used in spankings. For some reason, he was very strict on me. When he spanked me, he would always have like a female in the room. I never told my mom that, you know, he would pull down my pants and spank me. He always spanked me on my bare butt. My sense of the physical abuse was that it was essentially an overzealous and inappropriate use of what some people might call corporal punishment. And so that they would actually physically discipline infants for crying. 18 years later, Dana Okimoto still recalls paddling her baby son, Sky. There were times where I spanked him and he had a rash. And, you know, my paddle came up and there was blood on it. And I'll just never forget that. If I had any regrets in life, that would be one. That I did that to my child. Rumors of child abuse brought state investigators to Mount Carmel several times but Koresh vehemently denied the charges. I do not beat children. Spanking a child until the child's bottom bleeds? No, absolutely not. It's never been done. Ironically, despite the harsh discipline, the children felt safe with their extended family at Mount Carmel. The environment changed so much over time. But in our everyday existence with each other, it was just us being kids and having a good time. At the same time that these children had many wonderful, positive things that were built into them by virtue of living in this communal environment, um, there was this poisonous spice that was thrown in the stew. That poison would be Koresh's growing desire for total control, separating husbands from wives and parents from children. And this is the way we eat over here in America, with our fingers. And you need to come over and join us. Vernon Howell first visited the religious sect at Mount Carmel in the late 1970s. And by the late 1980s, he was the Branch Davidians' leader, their Messiah, and had renamed himself David Koresh. Well, it was because of King David, like, you know, because that's where he got the name, was King David. And Koresh, he said, was the last breath that you take before you die. There's the last exhalation that's like, that's what he said. By then, Koresh controlled almost every aspect of his followers' lives. Koresh used sex to gain control over his followers. He found biblical scripture to justify taking more than one wife with the aim of having more children. There was a doctrine around the Bride of Christ. Well, along those lines, there's other parts of the Bible that, that speak about a relationship with a woman, in Song of Solomon, for instance. And he would tie that in together. And that's where the idea of more than one wife came in. And the idea was to have children, and they would be God's children. Dana Okimoto was part of an Adventist group from Hawaii that had followed Koresh to Texas. As time went on, I was asked to be one of his wives. And by then, I, that, I realized this is a privilege. 
Dana soon became pregnant by Koresh. When I was pregnant with Sky, it was the most amazing thing that had ever happened to me. This was why I was here. I was serving my purpose for God, and that was really powerful stuff. Her first son by Koresh, Sky, was treated like royalty. I was a little brat prince. I was, I believed that I was supposed to be like the best person on the world, and everyone was inferior to me. Sherry Jewell, a divorcee from the Hawaii group, became another of Koresh's wives. Her daughter Kiri grew up happily in Mount Carmel's large extended family, but learned to be careful around David Koresh. He was very hot and cold. One minute, we would be out fishing, and everything would be great, and he would just be so friendly and wonderful. The next minute, he was like a viper. He would snap and just very volatile. Kiri and her mom, Sherry, were very close, even as her mother became increasingly devoted to Koresh. As time progressed, I definitely did notice that she started to sort of stray away from me. Um, I was, I, I became second to the, the, the cause, to what was going on, and it was hard. Kiri's long divorced parents lived far apart, and her father, David Jewell, found Sherry evasive about the religion. Before I knew the depth of her involvement with Vernon Howell, David Koresh, I knew that something wasn't right. I just didn't know how wrong. I couldn't conceive that it could be that wrong. One day in 1991, Kiri's mom brought her to a hotel room and left her there alone with David Koresh. Kiri was only 10 years old. He said, come here, and I, so I went to the bed. He tried to have sex with me, and it didn't work. Um, but we were, were naked, and I was just frozen. And so I think he realized that it wasn't my time, and so he just stopped and finished, and I went and showered and whatever. But he wasn't cruel. He wasn't, other than the fact that I was 10 years old and he was molesting me, he wasn't cruel. But Koresh's most divisive action was to separate husbands and wives, thereby splittering their families. Koresh found in the New Testament scriptures which says, we are all married to Christ which he took to mean that we are not married to each other. Koresh ordered married couples to live separately. Now, only he could have sex with all the women. For David Jones, giving up his wife was proof of his devotion to Koresh. I want to know what truth is, and David's saying, what does the book say? And he is showing me, and he's shown you, and a lot of other people, what that book says, and you will not hear it from anyone else. You know, I really feel that my dad had a very strong belief in it. I think he did definitely believe that, you know, he was some type of messiah. But Kathy Jones couldn't face becoming one of Koresh's wives. You were no longer considered man and wife. I mean, my husband was like my brother suddenly, and after 10 years of marriage and three children, that's pretty difficult. <laughs> and so I just, one night in the middle of the night, I just packed up my stuff and I left. Kathy made a painful decision to leave her kids with their father and extended family at Mount Carmel. That was the hardest thing because I couldn't take them with me because I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't know where I was going to stay. And I couldn't take them. I couldn't even say goodbye to them. And so I left when they were asleep. And when they woke up, I was gone. I was crying for mom so bad. And I went and told David, you know, I wanted to go stay with my mom for a little bit, you know. He told me if I ever left that I would never be able to come back. It was an effective threat, especially to a child. All the Branch Davidians were fearful of the outside world. Their religion foretold a fiery battle with armies of non-believers. 
David and his followers and all Seventh-day Adventists and all people who believe that the book of Revelation is prophetic rather than historical believe that the end of the world is coming. It's a question of when. And they believed that in a future time, the army of Babylon would attack them and that they should resist. Koresh started supporting the group by selling firearms at gun shows. The gun dealing caught the attention of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which began to investigate. On February 27, 1993, a local newspaper printed a damning article. The next dawn brings the government and Davidian standoff that will last for 51 days. What? February 28, 1993. The Branch Davidian compound near Waco, Texas, has now been under investigation by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms for nine months. That morning, Kevin, Mark, and Heather Jones are in the main building when their father runs in to warn Branch Davidian leader David Koresh about the ATF raid. Within seconds, there's gunfire from both sides. going in my room, getting on the floor, waking up my brother who was still asleep. And I remember my dad come in for a minute and told us, you know, stay down. We looked out the window and we saw the cattle trailers coming down with the trucks. We got down on the floor. I just started hearing all these loud noises, like um, hitting off a of metal and stuff. <laughs> I climbed backwards to get off my bed. As soon as I got off my bed, a bullet had came straight through the wall where my head was just laying. Nine-year-old Heather is upstairs, sharing a room with a mother and child. I was hearing everybody talking and screaming, running. I mean, it was just everything all together at once. And then I heard her scream. I heard her fall back on the floor and looked out, and she was laying on the ground, and there was blood everywhere. And here's Perry Jones, which is David Jones's father. Uh, he's crawling up the hallway on his hands and knees, screaming that he's been shot. I heard my grandpa. He started yelling and screaming. He was begging David to, to kill him because he had been shot. He was shot in the stomach, and he, he couldn't bear the pain, and he... He was yelling and screaming, David, please, please, kill me, shoot me. Perry Jones soon dies of a gunshot wound. I remember looking around the room and counting bullet holes. I mean, they had told us the Babylonians were going to come and, you know, there's going to be this big battle and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, they're here, you know. After two hours of battle, a truce is declared. Now, who am I speaking with? This is David Koresh. Okay, David. The notorious. What are you guys do that for? What I'm doing is I'm trying to establish some communication links with no, you. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. Yes, sir. You see, you brought a bunch of guys out here. We told you we wanted to talk. How come you try to be so big all the time? Already, four ATF agents have been killed and three Branch Davidians. Many have been wounded including David Koresh. Want to see one of the holes here? Here's one of them. How could this have happened? I don't believe that anyone expected bloodshed at Mount Carmel on February the 28th. The ATF was used to raiding dope dealers. They did not understand that the people inside Mount Carmel do not think like ATF agents and dope dealers and the rest of us. They saw this attack as having theological meaning. They thought the army of Babylon was coming to get them. I'm not here to defend or to support ATF's decisions. The people inside, the rank and file branch Davidians, I don't consider them to have been evil. I consider them to have been totally deceived. But as of about 9.45 on the 28th of February, 1993, they went from innocent, deceived people to murderers. They opened fire on ATF in the face of lawful 
warrants, and the rest of it just continued to spiral down to one of the most unmitigated disasters and tragedies in the history of this country. Byron Sage is brought in as the chief negotiator for the FBI, now in charge of the standoff. If anyone in that building was innocent, it was the children. So the overwhelming priority was to get those kids out, and that's what we started to do uh, early on. Can I get two kids now? Well, as soon as I get my tape finished. How about now? Well, that's not what we agreed on. I'm just asking you. If you like I say, are uh, we going to send some mothers out with these children? If you now, could. that's going to take some work on my part. OK. In the afternoon of the first day, we started getting children out. And that was an, an extremely good sign. We tried to get them all out. David's response was he wasn't going to send them out. He would send them out two by two. Everything was biblical. Everything was two by two, as if they were coming off of Noah's Ark. And it looks like a child. It looks like a child in the back of that van. Well, I got up and I turned on the TV and I started showing Mount Carmel. I mean, it was like I just kind of went into a trance, and all of a sudden I was like, I can't go to work. I said, I don't even know if my kids are alive or dead or what. That was the hardest thing. I didn't know anything. The FBI agrees to broadcast Koresh preaching over radio in exchange for letting more children out. Over the next few days, 18 children are released by Koresh. They're handing them some. Looks like a, maybe a child or an injured person. But Kiri Jewell, removed from Mount Carmel by her father a year earlier, sees a pattern. He was sending out kids that he didn't even really have that much emotional attachment to. They weren't his kids. Um, for him to get his message out there, that's what he cared about. I don't think that they had any intention of coming out. More than 20 children and almost 60 adults are still inside Mount Carmel. On March 3, 1993, Mark Jones is approached by his aunt, one of Koresh's wives. My Aunt Rachel had come up to me and asked me, you know, do you want to leave? And I said, oh, yeah, you know, I don't like getting shot at. Leaving the battle also meant leaving his father. Well, he just, you know, gave me a big hug and told me, you know, be good and they love me and, you know, that he'd see me later. The next day, Koresh permits 11-year-old Kevin to leave and join his brother. I figured that, that somehow it would end and everybody would come out. Heather Jones was the last child asked if she wanted to leave Mount Carmel, but she wasn't sure she could leave her dad. I don't think I really realized that um, he would not be coming out with me because um, I would have stayed. I really loved my dad. I was really, really close to my dad. So <laughs> it was pretty hard. Hi, Daddy. Hi, Heather. I saw you walk up to the gate. It took you forever. I know. Was you warm enough in your coat? Yeah. Yeah. You be a good girl. I'll see you, okay? Bye-bye. Bye. I love you. No one realized that the siege would continue for another six weeks. It's been six days since the initial firefight between the federal government and the Branch Davidians. And David Koresh has released 21 children from the compound. And it looks like a child. It looks like a child in the back of that van. After being questioned by the FBI, the children are brought to stay in a Waco orphanage known as the Methodist Home. Is it on? Yes, it's on. Hi, Mother. Hi, Mama. Hi, Mama. It was complete chaos for these kids. You know, they were all tired, sleep-deprived, scared, literally with people they thought were going to hurt them. In fact, the first words ever spoken to me by any of these children was, are you the guy who's going to kill us? While the standoff between the FBI and Koresh continues, children inside the Methodist home find comfort in being together.
when we first got to the Methodist home, um, I, we were with all the kids. We were in the same, you know, there was just a big room and there was, you know, bed, 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 bed. In the beginning, these children were, to the untrained eye, they looked pretty normal. But inside, it was clear that these children were all very, very, very um, anxious. The children were sometimes secretly videotaped and asked about Mount Carmel by the staff to help the FBI. Older children, like Mark Jones, were suspicious of their motives. This thing right here is the camera. They videotape us every day. This is why it's called a horrible place. I remember going to therapy, you know, out there and talking to them and being in a little room and being able to put your face against the glass and see through it. There's people in there looking at you. Stuff like that, which is a little, I thought was a little funny out know, there and they're watching us. The kids would show off for the staff, singing about religious martyrdom. They were looking for something and I was showing it to them. I'm um, thinking how crazy we were, how, how it had affected us, you know, so bad that we were bad kids or, you know, even when we grew up, we were gonna be terrible. I just thought they were crazy more than I was. I'm gonna shoot you right in the head, are you? The children had witnessed not only gunfire, but many had also witnessed the violent death of a parent or close family member. If you like shooting us in the head, why don't I shoot you in the head? I don't like shooting you in the head. Pow, 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 right in the eye, pow, pow, right in the eye. It was clear that they had some secret, that they knew. There's stuff that they know about this that we don't. And you'll see. You're, you'll find out. And so it was pretty clear within 24 hours of being with these children that there was a plan uh, to have a final battle, and um, they were expecting it. Um, they felt that the outcome would be uh, apocalyptic. A week into the negotiations, the FBI is still pushing to get more kids out. Koresh breaks his promises, saying God told him to wait. Finally, on the 7th of March, I can remember vividly that David, he got upset. And he said, wait a minute, you don't understand. The rest of these kids are my kids. They're not coming out. And there was just absolute silence in the, in the negotiation room because we, everybody recognized the magnitude of that statement. On March 8th, Koresh sends out a videotape of his followers. The tape was never made public during the standoff. I'd like to share with you uh, some of my family, seeing that, uh, of course, obviously everyone in the world knows something about it. No one was forced to and say in Mount Carmel, ice, to leave was to put your life in an unknown future and to put yourself in an unknown category in the eyes of God. Are you yeah. being held against your will? No, 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 no. Uh, do you have a desire to leave here? No. As more weeks go by, both sides are frustrated by broken promises. David Koresh, pick up the phone. Negotiators are attempting to get a hold of you. They would like to speak with you. Pick up the phone. We had not had a single person out since the middle of March, I think the 21st, 22nd of March. No one had come out for nearly a month. Nearly a month. There were times throughout the siege when he, the negotiators would be promising one thing and the tactical team, as they called them, the guys in the tanks, would be doing something totally opposite and going against all the promises or the deals that were made. The FBI increases pressure tactics on the Davidians, shutting off electricity, bombarding the compound with strange sounds. There were these escalating behaviors by the FBI that, that 
in my opinion, actually were going to make things worse. And based upon what I was hearing from the children, that they were essentially playing right into the hands of Koresh, that he, this is what he wanted. He wanted to precipitate a final apocalypse. We've repeatedly asked them to any kind of sign that they were willing to come out, but it was time to force a conclusion to this, force them to come out. The FBI convinces the new Attorney General, Janet Reno, that children are being abused at Mount Carmel. She approves their plan to use tear gas. There are still 25 children inside Mount Carmel. On April 19, 1993, the children of Waco will witness the final battle. Do you have any way of fighting fire in there? Only God. April 19, 1993. After a 51 day standoff, the FBI fires tear gas to force the Branch Davidians out of Mount Carmel. There are still 25 children inside Mount Carmel. We're in the process of placing tear gas into the building. This is not an assault. The time is to lead your people out now. The FBI uses CS gas, a pyrotechnic tear gas made for outdoor use. They know that Koresh has gas masks, but gas masks don't fit babies and children. Abusive as it sounds, and I admit it does, we were banking on that discomfort to convince the parents to bring those kids out. This is my daughter, Mina. Biggest mistake we made was that we did not accurately estimate the extent of control that David Koresh had over those parents, that we were depending upon the parental instinct. The tear gas, intended for two full days, is used up in just two hours. And still, no one emerges from Mount Carmel. All of a sudden, all this smoke came down the outside of the building. When it got to this hole, it was like it just got sucked in. And uh, almost immediately, it turned black. Six hours after the gassing begins, fires erupt in several places in the main building. The controversy over who set the fires continues till today. I could feel this tremendous heat over the top of my head, and that kind of galvanized me to get out through this hole. And uh, somehow I landed on my feet, I think, when I got outside and I looked, and uh, one of the jackets I had on, it was all just melting, and skin was rolling off my hands. The entire building is burned down in just 30 minutes. Clive Doyle is one of nine survivors from the final fire. But where are the children? When the fire started, I walked outside and looked at that building just hoping and praying that I'd see those kids coming out. And there were no kids. This Armageddon is televised. Kathy Jones knows her former husband is still in the compound. I know, it's just like a bad, bad dream. I just couldn't believe that that was happening. I mean, so many people had come out. And I just kept waiting. I knew it was going to come out. Kiri Jewell is braced for her mother's death in the fire. I watched the whole thing on CNN, um, and I just sat there. I didn't cry. I knew that she was gone, even though she wasn't physically gone. I knew that she had left me emotionally a long time ago. As sad as it was, and, and I, I woke up the next morning, and, and I, I remembered seeing, holding her picture, and I was crying. Dana Okimoto left Mount Carmel a year earlier with her two sons by Koresh. Four-year-old Sky recognizes his father on television. Oh, it ain't nothing, tough guy like me. They show footage of David. Sky recognizes him, of course. This is my one of my favorite sons here. They're all my favorite sons, but this is Skyborn and Scooter. When the fire happened and nobody came out. 
and every day Skye's asking, is my daddy dead? And I have no answer. It's just, I don't know, I think so. I feel like I was done a great disservice, you know? And I, of course, I didn't think things through at all. So it's like, basically, government's the bad guy. They killed my father. I can't do anything about it. I'm gonna be pissed and take it out on the world. I thought that, you know, something happened that I don't think even he planned for, and he would be angry too. So I felt that I could be angry for him sometimes. After the fire, the FBI finds all the children dead, huddled with their mothers in a vault. Most are dead from the fire, but some have been shot, including Clive Doyle's daughter, Sherry. I know they were wrapping the children in wet blankets and wet towels because it didn't have any gas masks for them. Certainly the gassing and the fire would have been the ultimate uh, horror. Tragically, there were a lot of lessons to be learned um, when this whole thing was over. And a lot of changes have been made, but that doesn't bring back one of those kids. At the Methodist home, the surviving children are told about the fire by workers there. Somebody went in the living room and turned on the TV, and it was the building on fire. All the smoke and everything. And then we, we kind of realized what was going on. I remember my sister just crawling up on her table and just bawling with some other girls. Excuse me, I'm about to start crying. My mom tried to get me out. I didn't want to come out. I didn't want to see anybody. I couldn't believe that anything like that happened. Um, most of all, I couldn't believe that, you know, my dad had did that. Um, I didn't, I don't know. It was really hard to lose my dad because I was really close to him, so. The tragedy of the 74 deaths from the last fire still haunts Byron Sage. Every one of those precious kids that are depicted on that tape perished in the fire. To this day, when you think back about that, that fact, it tears your heart out. How in the world could something with so much effort have ended so tragically? The FBI said that the reason it went in on April the 19th and the reason it used CS gas in a building knowing that there are no gas masks for children was that it wanted to protect those children. In its misguided effort and its arrogance, it killed the children it wanted to save. 21 children left Mount Carmel before the final fire. But how do they survive losing their families and loved ones? Hi, my name is Mark. Your name is Mark? Mark what? Mark Jones, babies. And what's your name? Hazard. <laughs> 21 children survived the siege at Waco, but their battles were far from over. After the final fire on April 19, 1993, most of the children at the Methodist home were set off to live with relatives. Except for the Jones children. They were left in limbo. Kathy Jones had to fight for months to regain custody of her children. They would question the kids about everything. And what did I let him watch on TV? What did I feed him? Where did I take him? If I bought him something, I was trying to buy their love. I mean, it was just never ending. State Protective Services wanted to send Mark to a foster home. They thought he was dangerous. Well, one time when I was building model rockets, and they had taken it away from me because they said I was building a bomb. Yeah, he's angry. His dad is dead. Mark was 12. He understood. He knew a lot more than he ever told anybody. He saw both sides. He saw the good and the bad things inside, and he saw the bad things outside. At the end of June, 1993, Kathy had her final custody meeting. I mean, he hasn't done anything wrong, 
for all he has left. And you're going to send him to strangers? I said, you'll ruin him. I said, I'm not going to let you do that. And when I walked out of there, I had all my kids. What are y'all doing? Come on. The Jones family all live and work near Waco today. Okay, put your feet up. Okay, you ready? Stay on. Heather and Kevin have their own children now. You ready? There's still many sad moments for the children left behind. You gotta scooch, baby, scooch. Anytime I ever think about my dad, I always end up crying. Um, I kind of hate myself sometimes because. I feel like I left him since how we were so close. I feel like I should have stayed there with him. That way he wouldn't be alone. I used to say I hated the government a long time ago just because they killed my dad. I thought they were the cause of his death. There was a lot of resentment for a long time. Kind of just let it go. Nothing I can do to change anything. He chose to stay. And died for what he believed in. Kiri Jewell was raised by her father after her molestation by David Koresh. And I just did my level best to make her understand that no matter what had happened, no matter what it was, that she hadn't done anything wrong. Kiri's not a victim. And, and she said, you know what, Daddy, I don't, re I don't regret anything that happened to me when I was a little girl. Because you know what? It made me who I am. Sherry Jewell died with Koresh, but her daughter recalls her with love. I was never mad at her. I understood that she messed up. I understood why she did what she did. I understood her mindset. But she loved me fiercely. She loved me so much, and she loved God. And the two didn't mesh well. 18 year old Sky Okimoto is now a drama student in New York. Only three when he left Mount Carmel. Sky has learned to accept being David Koresh's son. I sometimes have these dreams where I actually do meet him. I know what's going to happen if, like, he continues with the cult thing. And I try to kind of, you know, change that. But they never do. You know, it's something I can't really change, not in the dreams and not in real life. I am sad. And then I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, oh God, I am so glad I am alive. <laughs> because. I see where I am now. And I love where I am. I love the person I've become.